Thank you, Pamea and Rex Academy, for this opportunity to share my insights on EBP or uh, evidence-based practice. So, uh, good morning to all of you. Magandang umaga. Assalamualaikum. So, um, so I'm happy to have a conversation with you on finding how data can help implementing evidence-based practice in school settings. So. Uh, there will be two speakers for this um, part of the plenary. I'll be talking about practice EBPs in a school setting. And um, my colleague, uh, Tony, uh, Ms. Tony Alino, will be talking on EBP in the classroom. So real improvement in schools requires um, collecting and processing quality data. So any assessment and research initiative in schools done to provide a set of data and information and evidence or indicator that provides information about students, teachers, schools in general, and even school admin, for a school administrator. So when we speak of EBPs or uh, evidence-based practices in school, we refer to the objective, balanced, and responsible um, use of current research. I guess this has been emphasized by the earlier speaker, Dr. Marilyn uh, Balagtas, and the best available data to guide policy and practice decision such that outcomes of student learnings are improved. Without quality assessment and goal-oriented use of research on effective teaching and learning, school administrators are left behind when making critical decision in an effort, uh, I'll just put it, in an effort to achieve the goal of improving teaching and learning, which will eventually improve learning outcomes. Lacking good data on teaching effectiveness and learning outcomes, for example, school leaders are at a loss when assessing the return of instructional and learning development initiatives. Today, this is our conversation phase. Of course, with the assumption that you have, or you are gathering data, you are organizing them, and uh, you have completed or you are completing research using your data. Okay, so, Okay, sorry. A school is a data-rich environment. So education decision makers have access to a wealth of information from students, teachers, administrators, staff, and even parents and community. These data include basically students' test results, academic per and per academic performance, teachers teaching behavior or teacher evaluation as we call, uh, commonly uh, know it or uh, call it, instructional challenges and our school organization and even operational statistics, even sports, okay, uh, in information on sports program, on guidance and counseling program and other operational statistics. However, this data have limited use and could possibly be detrimental if we decision makers, either at the school level, at the classroom level, or at the grade level, do not understand the advantages and restrictions of data, the types of data relevant to decisions, okay, that you are confronted with 
and how the data can be appropriately used for your decision making. Schools are always searching for strategies and approaches to help raise student achievements and total development and wellness. Okay, and that's the reason why we're here today. School administrators, such as principals and even head teachers, rely on teachers and counselors to collect data, data use, and use a wide range of data to inform the session at all levels of the school system or education in general, from individual students to classroom, to school-wide, even district, regional, and um, national. Okay, so what does research say? Okay, I think this was also emphasized by Dr. Marilyn earlier, okay, but let me just reiterate it, that that no park and wall in 2007 established the relationship between levels of data use and increase in student achievement and total performance okay this is a big statement something that schools should not ignore okay or and and, and negate so what i hope to uh, you to gain from this presentation is the ability to understand EBP or evidence-based practice process applied in school setting, the ability to identify the types of data to be collected, the ability to discover what reports, basically research, okay, are more useful to teachers and administrators, the ability to determine the barriers and challenges in implementing evidence-based practice in schools, and the ability to ascertain ap approaches on how to sustain evidence-based practices in school. So let's begin to understand and appreciate the concept of evidence-based or EBP. Okay? Uh, earlier, Dr. Marilyn has given this definition that evidence-based is the process of collecting, processing, and implementing research findings to improve instruction and learning outcomes. This is according to Prisman et al. in 2014. In short, EBP is the idea that professional practice such as teaching and learning ought to be based on scientific evidence. This lists the reason, this is the reason why the EVP, EBP have been gaining grounds since uh, in education. And uh, we all know that EVP did not start in the education sector or education field. It started in medicine in 1992, and then it spread to the other allied health profession, Okay, even in management, law, policy, architecture, and of course, in our field education. According to Leach, 2006, the movement towards evidence-based practices attempts to encourage, and in some instances, to force professional, like teachers, school administrators, and other decision makers to pay attention to evidence in the form of research to inform decision making. The goal of evidence-based practice is to ensure reliability or up-to-date practices in favor of outdated, outmoded, and ineffective ones by shifting the basis for decision making from traditional intuition and, as, and, and systematic experience to firmly grounded scientific research. Among the benefits, and I guess uh, Dr. Lin also uh, uh, mentioned this earlier, of implementing EVPs for educators and students are, okay, an increased livelihood of positive child and student learning outcomes, Okay, increase accountability because there are data to back the selection of a practice or a program. 
okay? Which in turn facilitates support for administrators, teachers, parents, students, and others. Less wasted uh, time and fewer wasted resources because educators start off with an effective practice or program and are not forced to find one that works through trial and error. Okay. An increased livelihood for being responsive to learners need. And uh, of course, a greater li likelihood of convincing students to try it because there is evidence that it works. You will notice later on that Students have to have a buy-in, you know, they have to, they have to adhere, they have to like EBPs, whether you like it or not. Okay, uh, if students do not like it, do not, do not have a buy-in on your EBPs, then it is considered, okay, uh, you know, not really a complete failure, but it is one of the challenges of implementing EBP, okay? However, in spite of proven effectiveness of EBP in schools, according to uh, Cook et al. in 2012, some educators are concerned with the implementation of a new practice or program will require extensive time and resources. And that's true, okay? Uh, although this is true in, in some situation, it is not always the case, okay? Even if these instances, when it's true, educators might consider it worthwhile to devote the necessary time, effort, and resources when they take into account the benefits that you get from the, that, that EVPs or uh, evidence-based practices can offer. Okay. You have seen this slide from the first speaker, okay? But I am sharing it uh, with you again, okay? Putting in place an evidence-based practice in the classroom is already a very overwhelming task, okay? But more if it is implemented school-wide, okay? Not only you are examining the research behind the practice, but you are thinking about the data collection and evaluating them whether the practice is positively impacting your students or impacting your, your school. The figure here shows 10 steps for implementing evidence base proposed by Torres, Fardley, and Cook in 2012. I will not go through this again, okay, um, because Dr. Marlin has given you an, uh, uh, a bird's eye view of this. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, 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 Miss Tony, will share more experiences and how to do this, okay, uh, at the at the classroom level. So, instead, I will put these ten steps simpler by proposing a three-stage framework to implement EBPs in school. Okay. So, the ten steps proposed by Torres at all gives the impression that it is too cumbersome. So from 10 steps, I adopted the three states framework of the Education Development Center 2013 called Three Bold Steps Framework for EBP and superimposed it into the Torres et al. steps So uh, to make it sim simpler. So step one, steps one to three, the green one, I'm using the traffic lights here, okay? Uh, not for any other reasons. But step one, uh, steps one to three, put together states one, and I call it selection states. Okay, All right. So that's the first states. Step four and five were combined as a stage two, and this is the preparation stage of EPP. And stage three, okay, uh, were lumped together as a state, uh, uh, step six to 10, I mean, were lumped together as a stage three, and this is the implementation stage. So it is important that before you begin to explore a specific area of the EBP implementation framework, okay, briefly go over all the actions and steps in each stage to make sure you have sufficiently tackled and tapped 
all the bases that will help you to be to implement the EBP successfully. In each action step, let's attempt to discuss the concrete and practical strategies and tools to be to successfully implement EBPs in schools. Okay, so let let's start with the first stage. The first stage in implementing EBP in, in, in the in the three three bold steps, you know, framework. Okay, uh, superimposing, which is superimposed on the ten steps of Torres that. The first stage of, uh, in implementing EBP in school is to select, okay? You may be looking for an evidence-based program or practice, or you may find that a program or practice you're already using does not address the current needs, especially now that you will be following high flex learning or keep on doing online learning or completely going back to face-to-face -to -face classes. So at this point, you will need to select a new EBP. So I share you the concrete actions, okay, learn from the best practices identified from several EBPs implementation. Under step one, okay, uh, you need to conduct needs analysis, which is actually, you know, determining the environmental characteristics, okay. For this activity, you can use existing data or collect new data to identify and prioritize the areas of need related to teaching, learning, and school management. A needs assessment can define the scope, characteristics, and consequences of problems and will help you answer questions like, what are the problems that you need to address, okay? because. You are not implementing EVP unless you can feel or uh, you have a slight feeling that there is a problem that needs to be addressed. Okay. Also, what components in your curriculum, for example, require strengthening? Okay. And, uh, and what are the areas of not being effectively addressed? You know, and how safe because you, you in, in, in EVPs, you are not only looking into the cognitive, okay, but you are looking into the, the total development of your students. So you are also looking into the school environment, okay? Whether this is something that students and your teachers will have to accept very easily, okay? Your needs assessment should take into consideration also the procurial, sociocultural, and even the linguistic context of your school, okay? Particularly at the, at the basic education level, for in, okay, uh, you, you, need to, you need to use uh, the, the, the uh, mother tongue in teaching some of the subjects. So because this will help you select the best possible practice or program for your target beneficiaries. Okay, or your school, either by grade level or by subject area. Hence, you need to determine okay, the students as well as teachers' demographic characteristics. This is actually in the step one as well. Then the results of your needs assessment okay, uh, will be identified and shared, okay, and it, you know, and, 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 and this could form as the roadmap for implementing your EBP, okay? Uh, okay uh, for implementing EBP in your school. Second, you need to identify the gaps. Okay. You need to identify the gaps. Okay. Okay, then use your needs analysis to identify the programming gaps okay, in priority areas for different types or year level to determine if specific student groups are not being served by your practice or by your EBP. Then also look comprehensively at other services and intervention 
that are already exist or being implemented within the school. Okay. So DepEd, for example, has this resource mapping when you enroll, uh, um, uh, when they start enrolling students. Okay. You can pattern this resource mapping developed by the Dead App, Dead App to help you define the continuing programs. Okay. And uh, because resource mapping is a strategy to for identifying and analyzing the programs, the people, the services, and other resources that are currently exist in your school. So the information you get from your resource mapping can help you, okay, teachers as well as school administrator, better assess the needs of the school and make informed decision about where to focus change efforts. Okay. Look at existing programs that are not producing changes. Probably you have implemented a lot of programs. That's why uh, the, 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 beauty, okay, the beauty of EPP is that uh, you don't have, okay, as long as you, have, you develop it well, you don't have to go through trial and error. Okay? Uh, look at the programs that are not producing changes in your school, that they are intended to impact. Poor results, okay, of course may be due to poor program fit, okay, even the implementation or program fidelity. You know, when we speak of fidelity here, is that any, any, like fidelity is how close or how loyal our is, are our activity to our objectives. That's what I mean, like, you know, uh, our activity still, you know, within the scope of our objectives, okay. If the cost of poor program fit, a different program may be better serve student needs. If the cost is poor implementation, implementers okay, might consider, okay, or you may be required to do additional training and support. Okay, one, by the way, one of the key successful ingredient of EBP a CPD or continuous professional development. If the cost is poor fidelity or not adhering or not aligned with objectives, you might want again to review okay, who developed the program to help you better understand the elements of a particular program that are critical in ensuring positive outcomes. Next. Is find evidence, okay, uh, based programs and practices, okay. There are a number of methods that you might use to identify effective programs and practices of your intended uh, group, either again by school, by year level, or by subject like that. Okay? So you can search, you know, uh, the, well, this is a good thing about, about Mr. Google, okay. You, you can just type in evidence-based intervention and wow, Okay, you have 1,001 okay, list of evidence-based intervention. Okay. You can try, you can look you know, at every uh, evidence-based intervention and see whether your data, your school needs, and your uh, student needs okay, actually fit into that particular evidence-based intervention shared okay, through Google. Also, you can ask other schools okay, uh, who have similar demographics and needs, okay, what programs and practices they are implementing with success. Okay? And uh, at ADB, for example, we always advocate the network of schools because, you know, uh, like bigger schools okay, serve as the resource centers of smaller schools. Okay? And... Uh, and we encourage them to do collaboration and ask them to even allow teachers to observe and visit the schools while they are implementing an innovative program, okay? If you are considering a program or practice that has not been used and tested with your specific group of students, 
it is necessary that you read literature search. You know, you, you need literature to find out if there is evidence or you similar, okay, to your group students. What I am saying is, okay, uh, you may not have done any research for your school. And so you have to, you know, you have to uh, go back to your, the, the literature, okay, and find out, okay, what are the uh, EBPs, okay, uh, that have been uh, implemented and has been proven and tested to be effective, okay? If it is, uh, it, you know, if, if, the, if, the, if that EBP has been implemented similar to your school setting, then you can always adapt it. Okay, to do this, it is important that um, you convene a selection committee, okay? So after you have uh, identified the EBP that may be applicable in your school, okay, you have to select an EBP to implement, okay? And how do you do this, okay? Uh, as a teacher you, or as a principal, you may not do, you cannot do it uh, individually. It, it's always a collaborative effort, okay? So convene a selection committee, okay? Convene a review committee or a working committee, whatever you call it. Okay, whatever committee you call it. Like once you have narrowed down your search, okay, to a few programs and practices choices, it is important to include representatives from various stakeholders of your schools, like teachers, parents, principals, and even school staff. Because uh, in EVPs, by the way, okay, uh, this is not the only business of teachers or school principals. Okay, other school staffs, okay, uh, his staff have to be involved as well okay it is also important to get input from you know uh, especially if you are uh you, you you have partner institutions like rex for example who's supporting your evps or pebeya who's supporting who's supporting you as well in in some other way you know as they can help determine a fit with school and institutional capacity, compatibility with your own programs and services. And of course, okay, it is important that a funding is committed. Okay, uh, you know, uh, you cannot do EBPs with, a, uh, with only, a, with only a, without any funding. Okay, it has to be well resourced in terms of human resources as well as financial resources. Okay, now for stage two, this is about preparation, okay? So uh, one is, uh, you can be in a, a, a working committee, okay? Proper preparation is the key to successful implementation of your know, EVPs, okay, in your school because it is critical for you to learn as much as you can, how much the practice or program is working in other schools, in other departments or within your school. It is necessary that you engage stakeholders to ensure a receptive environment and collegial interaction and collaboration. So yeah, I have to underline that, okay? receptive environment, legal interaction, and collaboration. So this is not the only business of one teacher. Like EVP is not the only business of one teacher. It, it is at the classroom level, but if it is at the school level, it has to be a collaboration among all stakeholders in, of your school, including parents, okay? And, um, it is very important that you have to find the best people to implement it, okay? Uh, it could be teachers or administrator to deliver the EBP. There must be a director or there must be a lead, okay? For any EBP program, okay? And provide, uh, you know, whoever part of the implementation of EBP, provide them with adequate training and support to ensure effective implementation. So here, it is necessary for you to convene a working group, 
okay? A working group will often provide training, okay? The materials, the technical assistance, the guidelines on how to implement the EVP that you have identified with fidelity while adapting to meet the school's cultural, okay, as I have said, sociocultural as well as linguistic needs as well as the needs of your students, okay? Second, Be smart and visit nearby school, okay? Uh, right now, it is important to share, okay? Uh, uh, to share what other schools are doing, okay? Your schools are doing, and because knowledge sharing is very important now. So contact any principal or any teacher nearby schools that may be using EBP with similar, similar to your school, okay? Or, uh, or within your district or within your region, etc. okay? Network, you know, it's just so easy. And because, you know, even if, uh, uh, especially for teachers who are very uh, uh, active in social media, okay? Whether we like it or not, you know, uh, you know, ipapangalandakan nila yung ano, yung na, na may EBP sila, okay? And you should contact them and then ask them if you can do a benchmarking and do a visit. That's how you learn, okay? And, and also, uh, the third one is involve school partners and school holders, okay? Tap the resources of, res of Rex and Pimea, for example, okay? Because your partners and stakeholders, okay, uh, should help you, okay, or, or can provide support and direction at these states, okay? Uh, of course, it is important that you promote school buy-in, okay, uh, ownership, okay, and you provide staff capacity to implement the program. You also provide opportunities for training and planning and create a system for information sharing around the EPP. okay. Madali na lang yung information sharing, like isang WhatsApp group lang or isang FB group or isang Viver group. Okay, teachers can already share information, okay, what they're doing at the classroom level, at the school level, or even at the district level, hoping that you develop also a communication and advocacy for EPP. Okay. Dr. Marlin also emphasized that, you know, as as the as the number 10. Okay. But in terms of preparation, you already have to consider this. Next, uh, you have to select the, the, the practice implemented, okay, or, or the, the program implementers, okay. Choosing the right program implementers or practice implementers is the key to effective EVP implementation, okay. So when you are, uh, uh, when you are selecting, okay, what could be your potential questions here is that, or are your questions that you consider, okay. So, do the okay, uh, one is do the potential implementers or teachers or some have the appropriate skill set and background to deliver EBP? That's very important. Okay, how many implementers are needed to successfully deliver an EBP? Okay, which partners okay in your school initiative would be most appropriate to implement? Okay, and then. Do the implementers have, you know, the cultural and linguistic competence as well as a program management or practice management competence related to the target group? And can the implementers, okay, uh, commit, commitment is very important here, to full participation in professional development such as training to prepare such as training to prepare them for implementation. And lastly, are the school leaders, okay, uh, including school community? Like, I have to emphasize this, okay, particularly if uh, you're, uh, I know the, uh, most of you are in private schools, but those who are in uh, public schools, okay, it is very important that you uh, involve uh, the, Barangay, barangay officials, okay, the PTAs, okay, 
in 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 uh and you have you have to build up the enthusiasm okay for your evp so that they can you know you and and bring them on board okay give them okay give them responsibility for the implementation of your evp okay and uh also new evps or uh programs require staff to develop new skills of course you know uh, hindi lahat ng, ng, ng teachers are are ready okay to implement any evp okay program okay so before implementing an evp the staff involved or the teachers involved need a workshop or training to introduce them to the practice or to the to the program okay also the training or workshop should allow them to you know to develop sense of ownership kasi kung implementer lang yung teacher or school administrator okay and there's no sense of ownership parang it's just one of the many activities that you are doing in your school and also have the opportunity to practice teaching teaching a lesson or using programs so ito yung modeling okay you have to model on how to do uh ebps in your school and you need to choose okay the means of providing professional development okay and how it will be best carried out in your school okay uh for example okay so you plan for for uh so for example if you have a large staff it may be more cost effective to bring okay uh the implementer or the lead implementer to your school or district and 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 provide the, the professional development okay if you it's a few staff then and and, and the, the, the the capacity development could be done okay in group training or in group or if there are only three or five okay uh less uh, if there are only less than five staff who are involved in the epp then it might be good for the ebp leader to just simply uh, do uh, offer a uh, uh, one on one capacity building okay and uh so and of course okay after you have developed okay you have selected the evp you have planned for professional development the next is you have to pilot your program you know just you know ito na yon okay hey okay because by piloting the program or the practice on a small scale and demonstrating the success with your school uh leaders or, or, or community you can build support and a sense of ownership for the program and then spread the word to other uh you know to other schools okay and school staff and and, and what are the and, and what are the key considerations when for a successful pilot okay the one is for you to select a pilot group that is representative of your of the school or grade level second choose a skilled implementer okay practice lead as we call it to provide them with adequate professional development and ongoing support during the implementation and lastly which is very important you need to set up okay a monitoring system and closely monitor the implementation to ensure implementers fidelity or loyalty to the objective to the core elements of uh, the program okay i think uh, this is the last this is very important is for you to develop a monitoring system okay in order for any evp in your school to be effective okay they need to be implemented with fidelity what do you mean by fidelity again you know you activities mo ba uh, ano to? Uh, uh, aligned with your objectives are your activities loyal okay that's what we mean Lo loyal to uh the objectives of your evp okay and this requires a mechanism for monitoring the implementation okay because you want to determine if the core elements of the practice or program are being implemented as designed 
and also to identify support that you know the implementer or teachers may need okay during the implementation so you need to 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 consider this okay and uh, i guess this is the last one for uh, is preparation is to build the program ownership and this is very important okay and there are often challenges to getting teacher and administrators ownership okay it's difficult to convince all teachers okay, to be part of any EVP because they consider it as additional tasks, additional work, okay, and uh, without any uh, incentive of doing this. Okay, however, okay, it's really challenging because teachers, as we know, uh, teachers already have very full plates you know they they got so many things on their plate and they are under pressure to have students okay uh perform well particularly during these times and um and for administrators okay they, they may want to add additional burdens to student workload okay i i mean just workload because uh you know uh and and so Implementing an EVP is really challenging for a school principal because one, it will teachers will if, if teachers will not own it, okay, they may not cooperate or collaborate because they only think that EVP EVP is an additional work for them. Okay, so uh, especially if your school has implemented programs or initiatives or uh or 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 interventions that were perceived not to have impacted any okay uh you know it went without much impact you know it was completed without much in much impact okay to students okay you will need to make it clear okay uh that the connection between the EBP and students' academic success and the potential benefits of implementing a new program. Okay, so that part, you know, claro. Okay, your goal has to be very clear with your students, with with your with your teachers or whoever implementing the EBP, that you have a common goal. Okay, and they have to adhere to that goal. Okay, so. How do you do this? Okay, one is one strategy is involve teachers. Okay, uh, to choose the EVP, to identify the EVP, to suggest EVP that are easy to implement, especially if you are implementing it for the first time, and then later on, okay, have it integrated into your existing curricula, okay, and relate it to other. Uh, other uh, 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 uh other indicators like uh like school standards for example or curriculum standards or even uh depth standards okay uh, okay now the last stage okay for the state states okay which is you know uh this is from six to ten okay of the of the ten states uh model of uh, Torres okay, and, and, and all. It is about monitoring and implementation. Okay, so you have this, you have selected, you have prepared, now you need to implement and monitor it. When you implement your EBPs, you should be ready to anticipate or identify problems and challenges. And you should respond to them before they affect your desired outcomes and results so for stage three you you should be ready to take note and compile the best practices you gathered during the implementation because this will be helpful for your con for you to continue implementing your evp and when you will develop a new EVP in your school okay so what are the activities under under stage three? Okay, monitor implementation. Okay, which is actually uh, part 
of uh, of the preparation because when you prepare okay before you implement you should have already put into place some monitoring mechanisms okay and and this is very important because you should develop and use monitoring mechanisms okay in stage two before you actually implement it so this will help you readily identify and address needs and challenges as they occur okay uh i'll i'll, I'll just share with you okay wait sorry okay I don't know if you can read this. Oh, sorry, na balik tad palayik. Okay, uh, this is an example of implementation and sustainability checklist. Okay, you can adapt this. Okay, it's available online. Okay, it is by the uh, uh, Promote Prevent Org. Okay, uh, by the Education Development Center. Okay, uh, probably anyway. I I I will. I, it's it. Uh, the link is there. And I will uh, and I will be sharing you uh, this because this will this will ver be very helpful, okay? Because uh, it will allow the implementers to stick to the core elements of EBP and ensure that your program are in implemented with fidelity. You know, we are uh, uh, you know aligned, you know, oh, uh, implemented, okay, noting your program objectives, okay. Second. Okay, you provide continuous and um, ongoing professional development. And this is one of the identified reasons why a lot of EVPs are not successful. Because they thought that the moment they launch an EVP, okay, uh, teachers can already, you know, alam na nilang gagawin na. they know what to do. Okay, but that's not the case. Because, okay, uh, it is important for any EVP to uh, have professional development, okay? And profession in EVP for any EVP, professional development is not a one-time event, okay? To implement an EVP in your schools, you should need to have an effective, ongoing CPD or a continuous professional development and support, okay? Uh, so what are the potential forms or what, what would be the possible forms of a professional development? So it could be in the form of coaching and mentoring, okay? By a junior or by a senior implementer, it could be through your master teachers or lead teachers or department head, okay? And you can have a booster session, okay? Booster session in the uh, COVID booster. <laughs> but uh, you conduct regular and, period and periodic sessions to reinforce good practices and find solutions to challenges. You, you know, you always have to work with your, uh, with your working group. And then you can also have demonstration lessons, particularly if, uh, you know, for particular, like by subject, or by grade level, by skilled teachers or uh, or the master teacher, and um, it is important that you regularly, you know, share the challenges and success of implementing uh, an EVP. Okay, building out the time for professional development into the your school schedule will show or demonstrate the importance of the program to the teachers and that to uh, and that the administration okay is always behind that EVP. next is um maximize support system okay anyone leading an evp and working with him or her must always be ready to provide support and assistance okay in the form of guidance monitoring and process evaluation the key implementer of an evp will often provide technical advice technical assistance and guidance on how to implement the evp with fidelity 
while adapting it to meet a particular okay, uh, needs of your school. Next is the importance of data collection. Okay. Okay. Data collection and gathering of information about EVP should be an ongoing process. Okay. Not just because you have collected a data or a set of data and you have done your research. Okay. Tapos na yon. Okay. While you are implementing your EVP, you should all continue collecting and gathering information about the EVP. You have to learn from it. Okay. Hence, the data collection process. Okay. Should be able to inform. Okay both the process as well as the outcomes okay of ebp which are very crucial so what data should you collect or you should collect uh you know okay. uh one is you know uh whether the ebp is still aligned okay you know lumili his bus objective that, that, that you set or it's still within your objective, meaning it is implemented within the set goals and objective. Second, um, you have to know, okay, that the, if the EBP is appropriate fit for your school, okay? Third, you need to know also if there is adequate buy-in from teachers and staff and even parents and students. And if the program outcome data okay, are meeting their, the objective needs identified, okay, and uh, you, need, you also need to do this, whether the program outcomes are meeting your objectives that you have identified okay, when you in the stage one, which is in the selection and preparation and, and stage two in the preparation. And you always have to provide regular communication about the positive outcomes to implementers to school staff because this is how you advocate EVP. That but you know you should be proud that, that your EVP is achieving well or doing well. Okay. Uh, and uh if the desired outcomes are not achieved, okay, you really have to make adjustment. And this is okay and that's why uh, in, in my next, next slide, I have to emphasize the importance of evaluation in EVP, okay? And uh, the fifth one, uh, which is very important, is for you to develop sustainability plan, in, including advocacy, which actually is, is stage 10, okay? Uh, step 10 uh, in Torres framework, okay? You can promote sustainability by creating a supportive mechanism and system for highest priority for EVP. So how will you do it? Okay. Build the capacity of the key implementers. Okay. Continue to involve the school leadership to build buy-in for your program. And show the EVPs complement and coordinate with other existing programs of your school. And use social media to advocate your EVP. Okay. Um, Ang ano na yan, okay? Just make sure that you only uh, use social media for for correct and uh, and uh, correct news, okay? You are you will only you know you 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 don't fake news, okay? You don't report news, fake news about your EBPs, okay? And you really have to work with the school leadership, okay? Uh, and partners to create and later on so that. The EVPs will become an institution, it will, will be institutionalized. Okay. And uh and you will be you will find ways to leverage with your partners. Like, you know, Rex, for example, will be happy to know that you know the, the EVP that you they have supported, okay, it's working well. You know, it's working well based on the results of your uh, student assessment, for example. Okay. And then uh, the next one is I would like to uh, talk on uh, the importance of evaluation in EVP. Okay, as you move your EVP sex selection to preparation and implementation states, it is essential that you provide okay frequent relevant data about the progress 
at its states. Okay, so you have here, okay, uh, stage one, evaluating stage one, which is the selection. During the stage, you need to address the priority areas. You have to reflect the culture of your school, you, uh, that it will be implemented with fidelity, okay, uh, given the requirements and constraints on teachers and administrators. It will be supported within your school budget, okay, and most importantly, it will be sustainable. Okay. Evaluating stage two uh, during stake, you should assess each EVP or your EVP in terms of your group success and achieving the following program objectives by engaging and training EVP implementers, situating the EVP within existing curriculum, collaborating with key partners, uh, gamering, okay, buy in with ownership, meaning to say finding a very good strategy. Okay, uh, for buy-in and ownership, and you should create a system for uh, monitoring. And stage three implementation throughout the states, the evaluator, you know, uh, the EVP staff must provide the school director with process outcome, uh, process and outcome data about, okay, uh, whether the, the, the EVP, it's being implemented with fidelity, okay? It is appropriate for the school community, for the school community, and the, if there is adequate buy-in of EBPs, okay, uh, from staff and partners, and uh, if the challenges and needs identified by the implementers in stage one are addressed by the ongoing professional development, monitoring, and and support, okay. So, okay. So for my last slide, I would like to provide some tips for implementing evidence-based teaching practices. Again, as we have been discussing since the first presentation of Dr. Lin Balagtas, evidence-based teaching, also known as evidence-based education or evidence-based learning, okay. Basta, basta my evidence, my EV, okay. Uh, it is the principle, okay, uh, and Doc Lin uh, emphasized that it's a principle that, or our philosophy, that teachers should use research to make informed decision with regards to learning rather than being led on what has been used in the past, okay, and other events. So for teachers, this approach could be applied to the huge number of decisions they make its day from what should be taught on what day, how and when homework tasks should be set, even how they develop relationship and maintain discipline with their students. Okay. okay. The first tip is take slow at the start. Okay. When implementing EBP teaching practices, it is important to take small steps, take baby steps, and not to overwhelm yourselves applying new techniques that is digestible okay, in digestible chunks will benefit teachers and students alike. Also, by starting small, you'll be able to monitor the impact of the changes you have made more efficiently and effectively, okay, while also using this valuable insight to tweak and optimize these evolving practices. Second, ensure any strategy is fit for purpose, okay? Don't shoehorn an evidence based on teaching strategy if it's likely to fit with your existing framework and objectives. Look to roll out changes when you think it will have the most positive impact when students are likely the most uh, are likely to most benefit from these changes. Third, set clear lesson goals. This is where basic learning. Okay, once you introduce evidence-based teaching practices, okay, it is vital to communicate what you want your students to learn during each session. Okay, 
according to John Hattie. John Hattie is a very close scholar to Pimea, uh, right? He has been, I think, uh, uh, one of the uh, editors of uh, uh, Pimea Journal. Okay, and uh, we tried, did, were we able to bring in John Hattie? Uh, uh, I think we brought John Hattie or no, we were able to bring John Hattie in one of our international conventions, but hopefully we'll be able to. Jan Hattie is one of the, you know, is one of the known uh, scholars and professors of educational measurement. According to him, okay, and in his in his uh, visible learning book, 2009, uh, this level of clarity will lead students in achieving better results. Clear, concise, and attainable lesson goals will help both teachers and students to focus and succeed, okay? Fourth, ensure students get it, okay? When implementing the new strategies in the classroom or in school, it is essential to ensure that your students are understanding the information they are taught, okay? And there are several ways to monitor this. And, um, and uh, in, uh, in, in evidence-based teaching suggests that a random sampling, okay, this involves asking questions, posing, and other randomly choosing like, like the, the way Dr. Marin uh, started her talk today, okay? And then um, the fifth is dollops with feedback, meaning to say, give bits and bits of feedback, okay? Hindi yung isang bagsakan lang, okay? So you should be able to go, you know, this bits and bits and feedback and, uh, and, and this is also suggested by John Hattie in his, in his article, Measuring Effects in Schooling, okay? So he stated that, that any teacher who seriously wants to boost their students' results must prioritize providing them with bits and bits or dollops and dollops of feedback. Feedback is very important, okay? And that's the reason why I always emphasize that, you know, if you give a test, okay, and if you don't give any feedback to your students, okay, do not as well, don't just give any test at all because if you don't give any feedback on how the students perform in, in, in any assessment that you have given, then walang silbe, okay? Also, uh, the, the sixth one is reject ineffectual method, definitely, okay? Engaging with research should not just be about introducing new effective approaches to teaching and learning, but also about identifying and rejecting existing Okay, not working in effective programs in school. So in effective practices, for example, like you no, know, it's not working anywhere, then dump it and then introduce a new one. Okay. And then the seventh one, the seventh okay, is uh be willing to learn and develop your own skill. Okay, this is very important. Okay. Uh, the, the the director of Institute for Effective Education, Jonathan Haslam, explained that. It is in, in one of his blog that uh, the long haul, okay, uh, evidence-based teaching, the long haul, that the interest in evidence informed learning have never been higher. And then he had seen some events attract hundreds, if not thousands of teachers even at the way. So it is very important that uh, you, you, should, you should be willing to learn and develop your own skill. And lastly, okay, Patience is a key, okay? Don't think that when you introduce any EVP, you will have an impact right away. So, okay, uh, so, you know, this is very important. Like, uh, you know, uh, you have to wait, okay? EVP is a learning journey. It is not only for individual, but for the entire teaching profession. So, with these tips, I end my presentation. I hope you had a wonderful time listening and will remember this and take them with you as you embark on your journey of developing EVP in your school. So thank you. Uh, so uh, this is the, your basic takeaway. And thank you very much. Later on, if you have questions, you know, you can, you can find, follow me. You can email me, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, Ian mentioned about my YouTube chess picks. Okay, uh, you just try chess picks. Okay, and then you can have 
uh, all the materials, instructional materials on assessment, evaluation, and even research. And of course, you can find me in uh, Google site. Okay. Again, maraming maraming salamat.